Amen. Thank you, guys. It's truly our privilege, so we appreciate being able to come among you and share the Lord Jesus. He's uh, who we have to share. I refuse to share just the things of God that won't help us. We need the Lord. I need the Lord. And so um, he is the message. Wouldn't you agree? The gospel is a person. And his name is Christ. He's the good news that the Father gave to the earth. Any other gospel than the person is, is a cursed gospel, according to Paul in the book of Galatians. To preach anything other than the real gospel of Christ brings us into a cursed position. So, uh, anyway, enough of that. But um, does this thing come up? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, there we go. Um, Let's see. Let's you know it's hard. Uh, I've been obviously you guys who've been here know this. Just really focusing in upon the cross life. But I want to share before I get started. <clears throat> again, along that theme, I want to share a little bit. Uh, was really asking the Lord whether I should or should not share, and I've shared a bit of this privately. But I, I felt because of things going on tonight here in the room. Um, spiritually and something that Vicky said that was really important tonight uh, I forget exactly how you said it Vicky something to the effect that he's come to take the throne or something yeah yeah move over here yeah, say that again yeah that phrase was really strategic actually as to what was going on in the room and in the city so uh, uh, God knows how to confirm things it alerted me because of God using Vicky to make that statement to what I might need to share with you. Is that okay? So, uh, you know, uh, about, about three or so days before I came here, the angel Gabriel came to me. Um, and, you know, he had come to Roland Buck back years ago here. And... Um, Gabriel was referencing his coming to Roland and to the strategicness of this city. And really, uh, because this is the governmental seat to the state of Idaho. He, he also talked about the cross, which he had talked about to Roland. You guys know that, don't you? Thank you for your wonderful response. <laughs> How many knows that Gabriel talked to Roland about the cross? And God's never random. Ever. Years doesn't mean anything to the Lord. Time doesn't mean anything to him. So, uh, there's a number of things said to me by Gabriel and the fact of the strategicness of this city and of the state. But uh, moving forward in that... Um, God is angry over what's going on in the state as far as the bullying that is going on against you. Uh, demonic powers are behind it. I know you know that, but I want to be very specific with you. Let's look beyond people for just a second. Look beyond the government, federal government. This is going to be really point blank with you. There are demonic powers that would bully you as a people, as a state. Satan has some, I don't know what it is, all the extent of it, is somewhat alerted to the fact of the strategicness of this state and of this city. I'm just saying this, not because it sounds good, I'm telling you what this means is a fight. That's what it's going to mean. In the spirit. Our warfare has to not be carnal. We have to have the divinely powerful weapons that God himself would give to us. One of them is the cross. There's others, but um, prayer is a divinely powerful weapon. And there's different types of prayer. There's communion praying. Our sister was talking about this this morning. There, there's other kinds of prayer. There's submission prayer, not my will but yours be done. There's supplication prayer. There's intercessory prayer, and there's travail, and it's not of this world. 
and all are needed. Every weapon. You with me? We, we, I'm telling you, we're going to need every weapon and every warrior. That means prayer and a lot of it. It means striving in prayer. That's what the apostle said about it. It's what Epaphras was doing in Colossians 4, for the full will of God in the churches at Colossae. What are we doing? Where are we? Are we striving? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 30, Paul says, strive with me. He's talking about prayer. You can look that Greek word up, strive. Look into it. See what it means. It is violent. The violent are going to take this thing by force. Through prayer. You think, well, the sovereign will of God, why do we need to pray? Sovereignty is not enough. It is a deception to believe so. Sovereignty demands that it be matched by our responsibility. Sovereignty, except in a creative act, hear me, must have attached to it. If it's not a creative act, if it's dealing with people, and it therefore dealing with our will, sovereignty demands our agreement, our alignment, our willingness, and action. That's a fact. Anybody tells you differently is selling you something. I know that's straightforward. I'm going to be straightforward with you. The enemy would keep us from any praying. And if ever, ever, ever has been a time for travail in this nation, it's now. Travail is a birthing weapon. And the Lord told me a dagger at the throat of Satan. So it deals with the burden of the Lord what it is that he would do in our times. And we have to understand what it is he's doing in our times and be with him in it. Isn't that true? We read in Luke 12. His rebuke to them is they had no understanding of the times they were living in. No understanding of what it was God was doing. Is that us? It shouldn't be. It's not meant to be. So uh, <clears throat> we are in a place here I don't live here, but I'm going to deliver what I'm supposed to deliver to you nonetheless. You're in a unique situation here as pertains to our nation. The Lord is angry about this bullying that's not only been going on in your state, but it is going on in your state now, and the Lord aims to fight for this nation from this state. He does. It must begin on our knees. It must. It will quickly get to the government, this state government. The word of the Lord to the state government is Psalm 2. Be wise, you kings, and be warned, you rulers. Kiss the son, lest he become angry, and you be destroyed in your way. That is the word of the Lord, the whole psalm, to this state. To the governor, to the government of this state. Be wise and be warned. I'm not just spouting this off. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. I'm, I've been made aware, you know, this is really going to get out there and you may not like it and you may want to leave. I don't blame you. I'd probably leave too if I was you, but... Uh, But I have to say some things here that uh, are important. Important because we need to understand that, you know, visitors are important. You know that? When God sends messengers, it's important. Gabriel's coming to Roland Buck was an important point. Wouldn't you think so? Anytime God's sending messengers to the church or to individuals, uh, it's never random. It's important. So uh, you guys have some visitors. We had some of them tonight. We had them last night. Some of them are very important visitors. You know, of course, most important is the Lord himself, <laughs> who, um, they, after all, they are his angels. They're not ours. They are his. And uh, he's the great supreme commander over them, as he's meant to be over the church. Let me jump into this. Divine order is God as supreme commander, then the church, then angels. And we are out of order. Militarily speaking. 
Right now, the angels know more about God than what the church does. We are out of order. Don't we know that we're going to judge the angels? I'm just quoting the scripture to you. Don't we know that the bride's going to reign with the lamb on the throne? No angel's going to. No, well, you do understand that, don't you? I'm just trying to put scripture to it because I'm not, I see the wheels turning. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't blame it. Let the wheels turn. Think, pray, get into the scriptures. That's what we should do. But uh, this is all a setup of what I'm about to say. I'm probably going to go overly on this point, overly trying to explain it before I can say what I want to say to you. I could just say it, but I'm trying to give a little background as to why it's important. As the bride comes forth, the commander is going to issue his orders to the church and then through the church to the angelic order. That's what's going to happen. It is going to happen. As sure as the sun is going to rise. Are we there now? We are not there. Is there progression needed though? Yes. Is there a military understanding that has to come into the church as to divine order and divine operation? Absolutely. Wouldn't you agree? How many has been in the military? You understand then. Get in a fight and know the forces that are beneath you. You're going to get it taken to you. If you don't know how to utilize the forces that's been given to you, you're going to get it taken to you. If you don't understand their specific assignment, their specific capabilities, their limitations, their training, and you put them in situations to where they've not been trained, you're going to get it taken to you. I'm talking about the angelic order. They are not all equally trained. And there are some who are coming into this earth now who have never been in a fight. They are raw recruits, fresh out of training in heaven. There are veteran angels who have been in many wars and many fights. And some of them were in the room. You should be encouraged by that fact. <laughs> they have seen many wars. And uh, they know what they're doing, whether I do or not. <clears throat> so let's, let's get to it, okay? Who's in the room then? I'll tell you who's in the room. Who was in the room? Who went downtown just a few minutes ago to assert the rights of the lamb over this city? An in-your-face confrontation with the powers that be. His name is Fury. That's his name. You'll find him listed in Psalm 2, verse number 5. You'll also see him listed, and you can look at this, Psalm 78, verse 49. And there's other places his name appears. Anybody want to read Psalm 78, verse 49? I, I can do it, whatever. Let me read it. <laughs> Since I have the mic, that's right, Josiah. It'd be better if I read it. So Psalm 2, I want you to really pray around that psalm. It's important. These, that passage is important for you as a people. Psalm 78, verse 49, He sent upon them his burning anger, fury, and indignation, and trouble, a band of destroying angels. That's who they are. That's not all of who they are. What I'm saying is to you, there's more of them than just what's listed there. There's other lists of them in the Scriptures, in Psalm 2. In Isaiah 66. So they are God's angels. They are not demons. But Fury and those with him, they, there's a, I'm going to be really clear, okay? There's seven of them, and their leader over them is named Jealousy, making eight. They are governmental angels whose specific purpose is to confront or support governors and governments in this earth. Most of it is confrontational because there's few, if any, governors or governments in this earth that are of the government of God. So Fury, being in the room last night in the canopy issue, was threatening demonic powers in your area. 
and uh, they would not do battle with him. He is no one to be trifled with. Amen. I'm not kidding you. So, trouble is with him. Indignation is with him. Another one named fire is with him. Anger is with him. I'm just listing them here a little bit. Is that okay? So, um, I've seen a lot of uh, high-level angels, Gabriel being one of them, and Michael, others. Um, their assignment is unique, is recognized, and um, as I said, what we would talk, call militarily, they are veteran angels who have been in the fight. I'm saying this to lead to a point. I had to just say this to you. The assignment and the release of that angel means one thing for you as a people. There's a fight coming. God's going to push you to it on your knees. He aims to fight for this state and through this state for the nation. That's true. You know the challenge that that means for you. It is a serious challenge and will mean conflict and warfare on an elevated level. We have to learn greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world in this. And we're going to need all the help from heaven that can be given to us. Wouldn't you agree? So uh, uh, the angelic order, like us, like we should be, is completely after the great eternal will and purpose of God. You understand that? They are with God in his will. With God in his will concerning us. With God in his purpose in us. With God in his purpose concerning this earth. We should be on board with that, shouldn't we? So, uh, have you ever heard a message quite like this? I'm sorry if it seems strange. I don't know a better way to say it. And we've moved into times, folks, where we're going to hear a lot more of this kind of thing. We have to understand, we get out of the realm of lackadaisical lethargy, and we've come into a time now. We have crossed some, some timelines in the Spirit. And we've crossed over into a timeline a timeline now to where the unprecedented is going to become more and more common. God himself is going to be unveiling himself and revealing his will and revealing his purpose and revealing his desire in an unprecedented way. Unprecedented displays of God are going to begin, become more and more uh, a part of life here on this planet. I mean, actually appearing in the heavens. Angelic majesties appearing in the heavens. Satan is going to match that with demonic principalities posing as angelic majesties appearing. And the church is going to need great discernment on this. It is the showdown of showdowns that God is after. And believe you me, it is a showdown. So, Fury's presence means this to you, a fight, both in the heavens and on the earth. Satan does not have as strong a grip on this state that he does on many states in our nation. He's not been able to get it. It's not that he's not trying. He's not simply been able to get it. We're here to see that he doesn't get it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Seriously. What does that mean? Fight on your knees. I've watched this in angelic battles. I've watched them lose. You know why they lost? Because the church wasn't praying. You only have to see that a few times before you take prayer very seriously. Especially when the angels are assigned to you. So, 
My encouragement to you, I'll end it here. My encouragement to you is ask for, he glad, he is glad to give it to us. Ask for the mind of Christ in this. Ask for the will of God in this. Ask for a supernatural understanding in this. Pray over this passage in Psalm 2. This word of the Lord to your state, to your government of this state. Be wise, you kings, and be warned, you rulers. Kiss the son, lest he become angry. You be destroyed in your way. This is a time where we need the wisdom of God. If ever we needed that wisdom, it is now. Wouldn't you agree? We need, you know, what one translation instead of rulers there says judges. That may be a more accurate rendering of the, the Hebrew language there. Uh, <clears throat> our judges, especially in the Supreme Court, are leading us down a path of destruction. Whatever made it right for a handful of people to decide the fate of a 300 million people who are almost, uh, in percentage-wise, the high percentage is completely against their rulings. You wouldn't you agree? I'm stating the obvious in this. But the church asleep or rather than awaken, the church not fighting in prayer not believing that our battle entails these things. Folks, we are fighting for our cities. And we're fighting for our states. We're, fi we're fighting for the right of the Lamb to rule this planet. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Are you with me in that? Yes. It's obvious to me that uh, the church is too busy wanting prayer for its thumb and its leg and its arm and, and not seeing the purpose of eternal praying. Wouldn't you agree? What if we brought prayer on the ground of the eternals and got it off of our selfish needs and really had the mind of God in this? We're always going to have needs. You know what Jesus said about that, don't you? Take no thought for your own life. Don't even ask him. You just seek first the kingdom of heaven. And everything you need will be added to you. But we don't want to live that way. <laughs> sorry. I'm not really sorry, brother. I might be sorry one of these days, but not yet. <laughs> it would be amazing to see how quickly prayer would be answered if it was completely coming from the Holy Spirit through us straight back to God. And it was about the heavenlies and heavenly purpose and heavenly attention, dealing with before time, dealing with this golden altar in Revelation 8 and Isaiah 6. We need what Isaiah had. From that golden altar, they brought a fiery coal from that golden altar and touched his lips with it. And transformation started happening in him. And he became not only the spokesperson, but Isaiah became the prayer person for God because his lips were touched. And he came into heavenly understanding, heavenly praying, heavenly, um, the heavenly messenger God called him to be. Don't we want that? That's the coal from the golden altar of Isaiah 6 and Revelation 8. Same altar, same fire, same coal. So, all right. So I, may that encourage you. A lot more can be said. Gabriel's presence should be alerting to us, not alarming, but alerting to us. Uh, Fury's presence should be alerting to us as, as well as some of the others who are with him at this time. So I say this to you as the people of God. It is important that we understand that we have the full complement of what is God's will angelically with us in the present. You want the full complement that you are meant to have. Anyone's telling you, well, I have so many angels with me. My question to them is, what are you doing? Oh, what? not anything. Then you're living a fantasy world. Because angelic assignment is in direct correlation to the will, the eternal will of God operating through you. He is not random in this matter. Ever. Now, everybody in the room has one angel assigned to them. That's at birth. But what I'm talking about 
are those that are assigned according to God's purpose. I hope we understand the necessity of that congregationally and individually. Wouldn't you agree? So get involved in the fight. Get involved. Learn what it means to strive in prayer for the will of God. Learn the importance that sovereignty must be matched by striving in prayer for the will of God. It's important. Refuse to be random. Refuse to let our pet doctrines or the element we have hold of keep us from greater fullness, greater revelation, greater understanding of the wise master builder issue, of the necessity of all the elements coming together if the house is to be built. Amen? Is that helpful? Hurtful? Oh me, shut up. Don't say anything else. Yes. 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 These angels that I was mentioning here, what we're going to want, what you're going to want to do, these angels are going to leave, by the way. It's a temporary assignment. What you're going to want to do as a people, I encourage you statewide in this, is to ask the Lord for the full complement of angels of like, let's say it this way, function as what Fury and the others have. You're going to need it in this fight. So uh, that's what you want to stay on top of and want to ask the Lord for. That's a bit of a stretching, isn't it? I just love y'all's response. <laughs> oh well I, I play around I know what's going on <laughs> yeah yeah you ask the Lord though stay on top of this the more engaged you are in the eternal plan and purpose of God the more assignment is going to be given to you it will change regularly Just want to tell you something. There's a whole lot more angels than what they are of us. <laughs> and I, I've seen this in the heavenlies. A lot of them have no assignment. And they want it. I think the angels with me are trying to get into the unemployment line and resign. <laughs> resign. <laughs> That's my vision of the, we got to get out of this. <laughs> we went to a little place in Nebraska not long ago. I think we, almost, we counted up about 15 accidents we almost had in a short drive from Kansas City to, to Nebraska. And I couldn't help it. I kept picturing the angels, you know, just, you know, no reward is worth this. <laughs> <laughs> I had the whole family with me. Friends of ours from Kansas City, they were almost in several accidents as well, so it's just one of those things. So so it's bizarre, isn't it? I mean, after a while, you just get, that's enough. Enough's enough. All right, well, let's look at the uh, the cross. The cross... Thins the crowds. <laughs> and the cross really gets to the crux, which is cross, of the matter, internally speaking. So got a few things I want to look at this evening. I, I pray and hope that it's been helpful to really clarify the distinction between uh, the work of the cross, and then the cross life or the crucified life. You know, 
I hope that has been helpful to us to understand the distinction between what God did for us and what God desires to do in us and through us. So let me say a few other things in a beginning way tonight. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many of them there are. There's just about a page full, but I'll just launch into it. A truly, a truly crucified people are severed from this world's grip. Number two, when the cross has done its work and been internally established as life, the world has no place in us. Number three, a crucified company of people are emancipated from this worldly way of living. Four, thus the cross life is God's inward defense for each vessel. Again, if the cross life is truly in its place within, everything else will then come into divine order. Evil powers will have no internal ground among the crucified because of that life. The Lord will never, this is important, fully commit himself to a people that do not wish the crucified life. I'll read it again. The Lord will never fully commit himself to a people or an individual who will not embrace the crucified life, the life of the Lamb, the eternal life of the Godhead. Here's the positive. The Lord will trust himself or entrust himself to a people walking collectively. Don't we need this congregationally? Collectively in the cross life. The uncrucified condition of the modern church will never allow the Lord to bring us fully into his eternal purpose. If the cross is a work within each of us, we can trust each other. But if not, trust will never be between us. Let me read that one again. If the cross is a work within each of us, we can trust each other. But if not, trust will never be between us. That's just a few things. Um, I hope that went down fairly well. There's some more, but uh, we'll get to those later. I'll give you a break. Let your heart start pal stop palpitating for a little bit here. So I'm playing. Listen, folks, I want the cross. I want the cross life. I embrace the dying of the Lord so that the life of Christ may be manifested in me. There simply is no other way in this. To the measure that we embrace the dying of Jesus will be the measure that we have the life and resurrection within us. You agree? It's really true. So, in looking then at this distinction between the work of the cross, I want to read a few more passages of Scripture here. Just been reading a few of them as we've gone along, but this one I'm going to come out of Galatians <clears throat> chapter 6. Verse 12, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised that you may they may boast in your flesh. Verse 14 is an incredible statement, but may... It never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Listen to this. Through which the cosmos 
has been crucified to me. And I to the cosmos. Well, that's uh, quite the statement, isn't it? The entire world had been put away from the apostle. He was living in it, but he was not of it. It had no grip on him. It was not his source. It was not his focus. It was not his desire. It was not his longing. It was not his hunger. It was not his thirst. Christ and the crucified life of the Lamb was that to him. And then, a uh, familiar passage, I want us to uh, read here in um, Corinthians. I quoted it, uh, I think, this morning or last night or anyway. <laughs> I quoted a little bit of it. It's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech. See, um, What's all this training given to us? Cleverness of speech, the right way of saying something, what does that even mean? All languages combined, angelic, heavenly, earthly combined, cannot... smallness of the language and the capacity of the language of the scriptures. The limitation of the language. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, thank God for the scriptures. We need them. We need to be reading them, but I recognize their limited capacity to really speak of him correctly. For Christ did not send me to baptize. It's not in cleverness of speech. Why? That the cross of Christ should not be made void. In verse 18, for the, notice this language. For the word of the cross, the logos of the cross, is to those who are perishing foolishness. But to us who are being saved, you're being saved. You're saved. You're being saved and you will be saved. All of that is taught clearly in the scriptures. It's not a one-time event. It's a relationship. We've made it a one-time event. You know, this really, uh, just let, let me just say this a little bit. This really is uh, part of the root of the issue is salvation has become an end in itself. It has become the goal of God's people. Salvation was never the goal. Salvation was a necessity. Was brought in because of a fall or else it would have never been necessary. The eternal plan of God did not necessitate the fall. The eternal plan of God would have been accomplished by Adam without a fall, losing his life willingly in order to live by the life of another. 
It could have been a very easy way in this. Adam would have grown in his spiritual revelation and understanding as he communed with the Lord. So would his wife. And he would have at some point in time, because he didn't, eaten of the tree of life. But Adam had not eaten of that tree because as I was so told about this, only fallen man partakes of that which he does not understand. And Adam was in no rush. Time was meaningless to him. In time, he would have learned the significance of the tree of life, that it was representative of a person, the lamb. By communing with the lamb, eating of the tree, that's what communion is like, eating. As you eat my flesh, drink my blood, you have no life in you. That's the Passover issue. It's what we call communion, which is actually a marriage covenant. Jeremiah 30, 31, when I brought you out of Egypt, I became a husband to you. They never became a wife or a bride to him. I hope we don't make the same mistake. There's a distinction between coming out of Egypt and entering into the promises. The whole generation didn't enter in. They just came out. We're, if we're satisfied with salvation, that's coming out. That's not going in. You know that? Well, I'm saved. Well, what does that mean? I'll tell you what that means. The realm of the least. Every time. Forever. Well, anyway. The tree of life and eating of it was what Adam was given permission to do, but did not do. And once he fell, uh, that tree was removed, and he was barred from coming back into the garden. He lost the fellowship with God. So did his wife. So, um, thus, the necessity of salvation was introduced. The work of the cross was necessitated. And to be a disciple, the life of the cross is a necessity. We simply cannot be a disciple of the Lord Jesus without the cross life inwrought within us. It's an impossibility. So, let's get on with this. The power of God then comes to the cross. That's what I want us to see there. The word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. <clears throat> I made reference to this in Second Timothy. Hey, Alex. Hey, uh, good to see you guys. Um, in 2 Timothy, Paul says this concerning the last days. And I said a little bit about this last night. That there will be a form of godliness. Talking about in the church. But denies its power. Same apostle wrote these two epistles. It is obvious that Paul is talking about the denial of the cross life. The whole, as you look at it, of what he says there in 2 Timothy, the whole of what he describes as going on, not only in the world, both are in view, but also in the church, is the self-life. So the prophecy of Paul is this. I said this last night, but let me refer to it again. The prophecy is what we're going to see in our time is the rise of the self-life but to a degree according to the end of all things. What do I mean by that? To a degree that is unprecedented in the history of mankind. <clears throat> the self-life, the soul life, the suke life, the psychic life 
is going to be in the church. Prophecy is going to be coming out of it. So-called revelation. The cross will not be in it because the cross destroys that. I don't have to tell you what's going on already. It has begun. But what the issue is, is the inability of much of the church to discern the distinction between soul and spirit. And you know why, and I know why. Because there has not been the sword of the cross to divide the soul and spirit in us. You cannot do what you do not possess. You cannot grasp and understand what's not been done in us. The soul is strong, loves its will, loves its reasoning, prides itself on its intelligence. But it's not spiritual intelligence. It's natural, carnal, as to believers. So it's no substitute for the knowledge of God, though. And the knowledge of God comes to us not through the soul. God does not speak to you through your soul. The Spirit of God doesn't live in your soul. He lives in your spirit. And the voice of God comes, internally speaking, from the Spirit of God in your spirit, speaking. Comes to your spirit. God happens to be a spirit. And he lives joined to our spirit. The purpose then for divine order, what was lost in Adam and his wife, divine order, is for the spirit of God to live joined to our spirit in a relationship of oneness, governing us as a person, thus subjugating the soul, not destroying it, subjugating the soul so that the soul can become a useful vessel and the flesh will serve either the soul or the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to warn you about something called spiritism, which is rising up in the church as well. It's, well, you know, we need our spirit free. No, you don't. You need the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your spirit free is spiritism. You're not to live by a freed spirit. You're to live by the life of another. Just got to be clear, don't we, Brian? There's too much crap hitting the fan right now. No, guys, spiritism is on the rise. <clears throat> They're borrowing all this stuff from the New Agers and this. Why can't we just be original? God is so original. You know that? All this other stuff out there is at best a counterfeit. Much of it's simply demonic in origin. Isn't that true? <laughs> well, don't we want the real thing? that comes only from the Spirit of God? Don't we want the gifts of God to be from the Spirit of God? Don't we want to be able to tell the distinction between the gifts of God operating and the soul? Don't we? Don't we want to be able to tell the distinction in that? Have, let me ask you a question. Don't answer it, because I don't want to know. <laughs> don't answer it out loud. Just think about it. Where's all this prophesying gotten us to? Has it made us ready? The ability to prophesy, does that mean we're mature? What did Jesus say about it? They'll come to me on that day. They'll say this, did not we prophesy in your name? Did not we do this in your name? Do that in your name. He'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. We're in that time again. 
I'd be lying to you to stand up here and tell you different. We're in that time again. The church has not received the work of the cross. Therefore, it cannot discern soul from spirit. It is a simple equation. If you go, if you go on Elijah lists, God's confused. He's saying the exact opposites. Something's wrong, folks. God's not confused. We might be, but he certainly has never been. Thank you. <laughs> I never go on Elijah list. <laughs> Though I have been put up there, but it was not by my doing. Not that I'm against something. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this. Confusion, folks, is because... The division of the cross is not operative within the church. The life, the crucified life, the life of the Lamb, the eternal life of the Godhead is not operating. And we're so broken, and we're so afraid, and we're so childish. Sorry. What do I mean by that? We've got to be told God loves us every other day or we're over here like little babies wallowing on the floor. Sorry, but uh, that's okay if we're young in the Lord. That's not okay if we're 30 years into this. Or if we're 20 years into this, 10 years into this. It shows a lack of foundation, doesn't it, Brian? Somewhere down the line, we've got to reckon with this issue. Where is the cross? And where's the cross and the teaching in the church? And better said, where's the cross of the living in the church? Where is the cross in this? Where's the cross that separates and divides? Where is the division of the cross that splits everything right down the middle and says this is life and this is death? Where is it? I'm not fighting against something. I'm fighting for the Lord's will in this thing. And I'm fighting for the gifts back on holy ground. The real thing. I'm fighting for the real prophetic ministry. And if it's ever been needed, it's needed now. I'm fighting for the voice from the throne. And it's not desiring to tell us how good we are. Sorry, but that's not the voice from the throne. The voice from the throne is dealing with eternal matters. Outside of time. And the eternal will of God. You're not going to like what I'm about to say. You need to hear it. God will not deal with you individually. He has dealt with you in Adam and Christ. He has no need to deal with you individually. He's already dealt with you in the cross. That doesn't mean he doesn't love you. That means your answer is not in prophecy. It's in the cross. Can you hear what I'm trying to say? He has dealt with the whole of Adam, this man, in this man. He has put away forever this man. He's not going to heal it. He crucified it and buried it. There is too much of a need for psychology in the church because there's no cross in the church. Can you believe I just said that, Alex? <laughs> You can, can't you? <laughs> it's true, folks. Listen, I'm not trying to be harsh. I said it the other night. Psychology may keep us alive long enough so we can have a meeting with Jesus and really him do something for us. But it isn't going to come through psychology. He's not going to come to your soul. He's going to come to your spirit every time. He happens to be a spirit. And that's where he's going to come. That's where he's going to work. He's going to reassert his dominion over your spirit. And then subjugate your soul and force your flesh to serve the Spirit of God living in you. Amen? Through a severe crucifixion from which you're not meant to recover. Amen. It's the issue. So you made the mistake of coming the last night. <laughs> or, or maybe God tricked you. <laughs> Jehovah's sneaky strikes again. 
<laughs> we need to get some little things made up. Jehovah Sneaky was here. <laughs> Instead of Kilroy, Jehovah Sneaky. <laughs> That'd probably sell, you know it? See, I just gave you a good idea. Go make millions. <laughs> then when you make those millions... You'll stumble and fall because <laughs> you don't know how to handle money. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm having way too much fun playing, just playing. All right. So let's get back to this. This issue of moving forward, moving forward, understanding the distinction of soul and spirit. We need Hebrews 4 to be made real to us again. Wouldn't you agree? We need that desperately. We need the division of soul and spirit. Let's look at it a second. Uh, I'm, I'm quote it, but I'd rather look at the full impact of this. Hebrews chapter 4 directly is, is dealing with this. And so, verse 12, for the word of God. This is the living word of God. So it's speaking of Christ himself, the Logos. But I have to say that if you want the living word of God, you're going to want the written word of God because the written word of God speaks of the living word of God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you're going to want both, and both are weapons, and we need those weapons, right? I love the scriptures because I love the word of God, the living one, Christ. And if ever we've needed to get into the scriptures and get away from teachers, it's now. Let Christ be our teacher in this. Let the Holy Spirit take these scriptures and unveil him. Amen? So the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It was the two-edged sword that's coming out of his mouth there in the book of Revelation to the church. Isn't it? Just want to connect the dots here a second. <clears throat> John sees him in Revelation chapter 1 with this two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. <clears throat> He's confronting the church, I think it's at Pergamum, with the two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. So, uh, <clears throat> get a drink. so it's a description here of the Lord, and it's piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, this issue of division of soul and spirit. Luke chapter 12, do not think that I've come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword. You know what he's saying? Don't think that Christ is coming to your family to bring peace in your family. He's come to bring the sword first. Peace is the other side of the sword. <coughs> That's good preaching. I don't care what you think about it. We want peace, to, peace at any cost. There's a, there's a piece that's only the other side of war in this called the cross, the sword. Jesus said, no, I've came to bring the sword. I've come to bring division. That's what he said. Luke 12, I came to bring division. I came to bring it right into your family. That's what he describes it. <clears throat> so he's separating this man from this man and all that's of this man and putting it away including family. That went down like a rat sandwich. but So it's the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow. And listen to this, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Underline that. So this division of soul and spirit deals with, doesn't it, Brian? It deals with, it has to, the thoughts and intentions of my heart. What do I believe about this person? Christ. What is his significance? What is his purpose? What is his meaning? What is the full thought of the Godhead concerning him? What does it mean to call him Lord? And is he? What image am I making of him? <coughs> Dealing with Mary now. Luke chapter 2, I quoted it. You can go back there and look. You tie these together. The prophecy is this one is appointed to the rise and fall of many in Israel. Let me say it this way to you. This one is appointed to the rise and fall of many in the church. 
<coughs> we think of it only being for our benefit. I'm telling you, for him to have what he wants, there must be a division. There has to be. This is what's the prophecy that comes to Mary at that point in Luke 2. The sword is going to divide your soul. It's going to pierce it, your own soul in this. Could have said this to her, because what you think of this child and what you will think of him as a man and what you think his purpose is and what you, get this, what you think his destiny is. And let me say this to me and let me say it to you. What you think your destiny is and what I think our destiny is, is completely false. Let me tell you about your destiny in knowing the Lord first and foremost. If you really want to know him, let me tell you about your destiny on this earth. It's best summed up in Romans chapter 8. You're here to be led like a lamb to the slaughter. That's why you're here. I didn't think I'd get any applause for that. (laughs) You're here to embrace the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested to others. That is the lamb nature. And if you're going to be the bride, if you want to be the bride, that is the life. Lambs led to the slaughter. We look for the easy path, the easy way, ministry, making a name for ourselves. God's looking for the cross in a people. He's looking for the vessel he wanted. Listen, this is a novel idea. He's looking for that vessel that brings glory to him. He's looking for a vessel that understands this. What does God get out of this relationship? not just me. What did God want in the creation of humanity? What did God want for his son as a bride? Who's meant to be glorified? Who's meant to shine forth out of Zion? Amen. There's nothing selfish in that. It's selfless. The dying of Christ in us alone And embracing that will bring forth that resurrection life. Let me say it in a question that the Lord said to me personally. Let me just say it to you. Won't you allow me to make you an altar upon which my sacrifice can be offered to others? You are meant, and I am meant, to be an altar upon which the sacrifice, the lamb, is presented to others. That's why we're here. But that's dealing with purpose. Hebrews 6 has to come into play at some point in time, verse 1. We have to leave the elementary principles. Wouldn't you agree? And doctrines of Christ and go on. I want that. I embrace the cross. Embrace what God's after in this. I'm not going to go long tonight. I want to read a few things. Um, 21. (laughs) What does that mean? Three hours? No. (laughs) That's right. I got to find it first. You know, I actually sometimes get to use my notes. All right, this is positive. I want you to take note of that. 
<laughs> Just thought I'd throw you off. <laughs> God is so positive, especially when he's in a wrath mode. He knows exactly what he's doing. You know, you know, <laughs> there's something on the other side of this shaking that is the bride seated on the throne with the Lamb. I'm ready for the ending of all things. And I'm not praying to stop it. I'm praying for it to come in our generation. The Lord has said this directly to me. I would end all things if my bride would make herself ready. And if we want, he'll go on to the generation behind us. He isn't coming until she makes herself ready. He's going to. He told me in an encounter, he said, that date was never random as to my coming. It was always coupled with the bride's readiness. So uh, that's, uh, I don't know how long that invitation is open to us. I don't know how long the window is open to us. It's not open forever. So I would like to see the end by becoming, wouldn't you? By being joined, becoming one with him, becoming the bride we're meant to be. Wouldn't you? The bride through which the Lord is going to clear the heavenly antagonistic beings. Yeah. You were, listen, you were created for a fight. So being a warrior is not an option. You don't have to be a warrior. You can just get beat on. <laughs> you might grow tired of that after a while. We're, listen, we have a very real intent here now. God is training us for reigning we're being trained to reign. That means conflict. That means battle. That means temptation. He cannot bring an immature vessel, and he will not bring an immature vessel to the throne. Amen? You blame him? <laughs> and he's not going to have a repeat of a cherub who decides he doesn't want the Lord anymore. And he was never tested. He was never tempted. The greatest purpose of God lies around the vessel who is in the greatest struggle. The greatest purpose of God lies around the vessel who has known battle since we started breathing. Everything of this world that is antagonistic against God has planned our death. The greatest purpose of God lies around those who have the greatest conflict going on. We are being trained by battle. We're being trained through conflict to reign. And it begins here and now by him reigning in us in this life. Him taking his throne and putting it inside of us and reigning over every antagonistic thing that's in this earth and in the heavens above us that is arrayed against us. We're being trained through conflict. Stop praying to get out of battle and conflict. You'll, you'll be immature forever. The way to maturity is conflict and battle. The God, purpose of God for you is not an easy life. It is a life of war. You've been born for it. You were created, humanity was, after the fight had started in the heavenlies, to end the fight. Where'd you learn this, Terry? By direct encounter with the Lord. 
And I say this all the time. I heard it from the Lord. That's why I say it. The playground of Satan is attached to the school of Christ. It's an inescapable fact. If you want to be a threat, then you must have your hands trained for war. And know that we have divinely powerful weapons to the pulling down. Amen. I want to read Ephesians 6 and read 2 Corinthians 10 and our warfare. You say, well, there's no war. Just read the scriptures. Our warfare. You're in war. Fight back, but do so with divinely powerful weapons. And Paul makes it emphatically clear in Ephesians 6, verse number 18 and 17, that the greatest weapon is prayer. With all prayers, praying at all times. Amen. That's in my Why We Fight series. If you want to listen to it, it's free. So anyway, there's 12 of those. Feel free to listen. I'm just barely touching it. So what I want to be positive about is what the cross life achieves for God. And we'll end with this. You guys know we're just scratching the surface of the cross here and the cross life. But where our desire, deepest desire is for God to bring this distinction between that work that he's done for us and us being the benefactors of the work and bring the distinction between though that's necessary and though we must reckon that work, that that's only one part of the work. The other part of the work is the cross life enwrought within us, the lamb nature becoming his kind. So let me present these 21 things here. The cross life means an inheritance of the new humanity to the Lord. The cross life assures a people made ready The cross life releases and refines the bridal spirit, how important that is. You ever considered that, that God, when he created man, put within him a bridal spirit? I must be joined. That's how it operates. It's not good for man to be alone. I must be joined. I must have a mate. God put that in man before the fall. God said, It's not good for you to be alone. Not Adam. (laughs) The bridal spirit. That I can only come, here it is. Genesis 2. That I can only come to the full will of God, the full eternal purpose of God, with a bride. God himself brought himself into that purpose. That the eternal purpose can only come to reality through the bride and the bridegroom. That is love. You know that, brothers and sisters. That's not the love just of salvation, which is necessitated. That's a love of giving yourself completely. (coughs) It is a selfless love. What a depth it has and a breadth it has and a width it has and a depth it has height it has (coughs) so the bridal spirit we're in a fight for the bridal spirit in this nation through the attack of homosexuality let's see it for what it really is (coughs) amen you have to see beyond people and see the workings of the enemy Now, people are caught up in it. I'm not making excuses. I'm saying this to us. But what's he getting at? No bridal spirit. No bride. So, the cross life allows for God's full commitment to that vessel. Talked a little bit about that earlier. The cross life brings us onto eternal ground and eternal purpose. Nothing else will. I'm wanting us through this just to see how the bride is readied. The cross life brings forth the image of Christ inwardly and outwardly. Image, image. 
In the Old Testament, God had a commandment, didn't he? You shall not make any graven images unto me. <clears throat> now, let's look behind that, why God said it. Because man was to be conformed to an image, and that image is Christ. God had an image that he wanted us conformed to. God had an image that he wanted us to be like in kind. He forbid any other image and directed us to a single image, Christ and him crucified. All that God has ever said carries behind it meaning, purpose, eternity. He is never random. We are to be conformed to the image. Hebrews chapter 1. Christ is the exact image or representation of God. Is he not? And we, the bride, are to be conformed to the image of Christ. So that representation in the heavenlies can proceed forth according to the great eternal plan. So that, I say this again, so that this vessel that God has desired, not needed, but desired, wanted, committed himself to in the eternities and the eternals may come forth and begin something much larger than a creative act begin a transformation of the heavens. That the created beings would be moved off the ground of their present immaturity through a bride who is displaying the invisible God to them, who are witnesses of the Lamb. There is a great work in front of us, and for us, it has no ending. It begins here, but it has no end. That great work is representation. There's other components to that work, but representation is the key. And the scripture is clear. It must be exact representation. The transparency. Troy and I have been talking about this may be easy to look at, oh, that's transparent. But transparency means this, that the bride is not seen. She's transparent, pure gold. The lamb who is in the center of that city is seen. That's exact representation. God will have nothing, less. that's why we're in a fight for this. Can you understand the need for battle in this? Because the church brings it down to lower level things and wants to fight for lower level things. And I have no interest in fighting for that crap. I will not be drawn into it. Stupid battles that are going on in the church. Too busy in the real fight with the real enemy. Who isn't my brother? And who isn't my sister? We're so busy creaming one another and the tongue is so unleashed in the church. Wouldn't you agree? Well, anyway, I can say a lot more about that. But the real fight that's going on here, let it not be obscured to us. Obscured by lesser things, secondary issues. The real fight that's going on here is for right representation, exact representation. God wanting a vessel to rightly represent him in exactness to the rest of the creation, to this earth and then to the heavenlies. We are in a fight for this. I refuse to settle. I didn't in marriage, and I refuse to settle any other point in time. Refuse to settle. I will not settle for anything less than the eternal. God's purpose, God's will, God's desire, not my will. That's the great, this man. 
and being with him in this. This man, not my will, yours be done in this. We're in a fight for the will of God in the church now. We're in a fight for complete, exact representation. We're in a fight for purity. We're in a fight for light. We're in a fight for righteousness. We're in a fight for every conceivable thing that has to do with exactness of representation. We're in a fight for it. Doctrines of demons have come into the church that's making excuses for our sins rather than simply humbling ourselves and repenting. Amen. That's what's going on. Behind all of it is Satan's great lure. No representation. No bride. No transparency. See what's going on here? Get involved in the right fight and you, don't, you ain't got time to fight people. You're too busy fighting in the heavenlies. I'm not kidding you. Say, well, we shouldn't even be fighting there. Who told you that lie? That's not what the scripture says. Our warfare is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities. Spiritual forces of wickedness in the high places. We were meant to fight. But we can't fight as long as they have something in us. They'll clean your clock. Amen. Such is life as it's meant to be with the church. What the church is meant to be. A threat to these heavenly powers. Not cowering. Amen. Not controlled by them. Not under their hand. We should be under the hand of God. Wouldn't you agree? No other hand. All right. So I'm, where am I? There's only 21. I'm still on one. Okay. No, I'm not. I'm further, further along than that. <laughs> six. I'm, I'm, this is six. <clears throat> Seven. The cross life will cause oneness with God's heart and intention. Eight. The cross life is the one life that allows unity. How we need to hear that. So we're trying to get to unity in all the wrong ways. Trying to come down to some low level and agree. There's only unity in, in oneness in the cross. And what I mean by this, let me be very clear. This man no longer lives. This one is our life. Only one man lives in us. We have the life of but one filling the many. We are family, therefore. Like it or not, I'm a part of your family. <laughs> I know it's the dark side of your family, but <laughs> but darkness only reveals the intensity of the light greater than so. <clears throat> so the cross life is the one life that allows unity. You simply cannot have unity in a man of division. All the nations' division came from this man. All the races, division, came from this man. This is the man of division. Now let's come here. In this man, there is no races. It does not exist. There is no Jew and there is no Gentile. They do not exist in this man. There is no male and there is no female. And there is no slave and there is no free. We are dragging this man into this one. And the gospel has been destroyed. That's heavenly ground though, see. That's what we won't come unto. That's the work of the cross. It is the end of this man and his division. God help us to let that crush our little pet peeve doctrines that we love so much. Are we even willing to let that happen? Talking about embracing the cross. Let's embrace the cross. Then we get to our pet peeve doctrines. I love that doctrine. That's why the Lord aims to crush it and bring Christ out, the only one worth believing in. 
It's hard for us, isn't it? I can feel it in the room. My doctor. <laughs> well, it won't make it past the end of your natural life. It will end there at the grave. Anyway, are not to 21 yet? <laughs> <laughs> the cross life brings the realization of the unshakable kingdom within the vessel and how we need that as we head into the storms that are going to confront us in an ever increasing way in this nation different types of storms <clears throat> economic storms governmental storms, religious storms, and only that which is built upon the foundation will withstand it. The one rock. The cross life is where true ministry, where God's authority and power are brought together. that we not glory in anything other than the cross. True ministry begins in the cross of Christ. The cross life alone will keep us on the straight and narrow heavenly path, not simply the path to heaven. I have to make this comment. We just think it's the path to heaven. No, it's the heavenly path. It's the cross life now. It's heaven's will being done in this earth through us now. The gospel is a now gospel. And heaven is not our great goal. Being conformed to the image is. Heaven is not our great goal, nor is it our great gift from the Father. Being conformed to the image is our goal, and Christ is the gift of the Father. Cross life means God's spiritual ascendancy over the flesh the soul, and the devil. Satan was defeated by the cross of Christ. He was conquered by that cross. And the reason Satan has such free spiritual ascendancy in the church, in the present, the reason Satan has such open doors of activity within the church is because there is no cross in the church. Therefore, there can be no victory. Simple equation. Thirteen, the cross life means the full, complete work of Christ realized. Isn't that a great word? See, he finished the work, but it isn't finished in us. That's the distinction between the work of the cross and the cross life working in us. And I never, never argue that fact. Yes, he finished it, but it isn't finished in me. It's not perfected in me. Blind man can see that. Not being harsh, I'm just telling you the truth. We just want to reckon something to ourselves without the cross working in us. That's mine. I'm entitled to it. No, it comes by the cross life working in us. Maturity comes by the cross life working in us. Growth comes by the cross working in us. Conformity comes by the cross working in us. Image comes by the cross working in us. 14, the cross life allows the God of glory to fully presence himself among a people and dwell within and among them. 
15. The cross life allows us to be, uh, to bring us to the original eternal thought and purpose for man's creation. 16. The cross life ensures God's growth, his upward and downward growth. Both are necessary. After all, a tree is only as strong as its roots. And if, uh, <clears throat> if we have lots of branches and no depth, the storms are going to easily topple us. It is a foundational issue. Isn't it? We're called to be oaks of righteousness, and you know as I know that the oak's strength lies in the depths of its roots. Doesn't it? It's foundation. So it is that life of the cross working in us, bringing us not only unto heavenly ground, but it is the division of the cross separating at a foundational level that which is not the life and that which is the life. It is emancipating. It is severance from the world, from the flesh, from our soul, from our self-life. Amen? The entirety of this world is under the dominion of Satan and his power over it lies in the soul. Seventeen, the cross life means a pure gold transparent vessel that God shines forth out from and releases life and peace to all who come to those waters of life. That, that was the blessing. I said this the other night. That's the blessing to the Levitical priesthood of, by covenant is life and peace in Malachi 2. 18, the cross life means the city of God coming down out of heaven. Realized. No bride, no new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem is the bride. And yes, there's a natural city, but only because there's first a spiritual city. The spiritual comes first. The natural city is a wedding gift from the father to the bridegroom and the bride. 19, the cross life means God's government and nature and a people, a nation a priesthood, showing his excellencies in the now and in the future. 20, the cross life means meaningful, eternal relationship with God and his people and creation. I'm saying this in reference to um, Romans 8 and this issue of the whole of the creation awaiting, waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. That their deliverance is bound up with ours. Our readiness and our conformity are coming into the fullness of why God created us. 21, cross life means the fruit of God's life, nature, filling and expressed through a vessel. That is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is nothing less than the nature of God in view it's his nature it's meant through Christ being in us to be not only in us but expressed through us and fruit my friends is where approval lies not gifting wouldn't you agree it's not a matter of giftedness and accuracy. It's a matter of fruit and life. We are training a generation in giftedness. And we are completely lacking a generation of disciples. There is no cross. And we're funding the bill. Whether you like that statement or not, we're funding the bill. We're supporting the activity. 
or running to it. I need to know how to minister in the gifts. What about the cross? What about the foundation? Do we really have to go around this mountain again to where we have great gifting and it ends in tragedy again in shame and reproach upon the name of Christ? That's where it will end without the cross, without the foundation. It's a done deal. It cannot be stopped. How many times do we have to see this? Be it. Finance it. Support it. Before we become sober-minded and see what's really happening. There is no better place of training than the local congregation of God who know you and see your faults, see your mess-ups, see you. We need to be seen. The church was always meant to be the training school of Christ. But I'm not talking about the organized thing. I'm talking about the real church. You know who I am. Not call, talking about this thing that calls itself church. It's based around meetings, based around doctrines, based around everything but Jesus. I'm talking about the real church who God never saw as being anything different than the bride. Church was always meant to be the bride. The whole of humanity was meant to be the bride. The invitation was to every one of us. No one's left out. But we have to now make a distinction between the bride and the church because of our language. I plead with you people. Let the work of the cross come into us. Let the division of soul and spirit happen. Let it bring us to a place of spiritual discernment again, spiritual understanding, where we can tell the distinction between that which is of the soul and that which is of the spirit. Not in order to crush people, but in order to truly bring forth in a people the will of God. The, and even more than that, the ways of God. That's why God got onto Israel. They saw his miracles, but they did not know his ways. Miracles don't teach you God's ways. Isn't that true? And it does not impart life. Life is imparted through the cross. What if we made a willing choice here tonight? Declaration is really important. What if we made a choice to embrace the cross? The dying of Jesus. That the life of Jesus may be manifested through us. What if in that determination, in embracing that cross, we realized more than ever before that this is the way to maturity. This is the way to conformity. This is the way to image. This is the way to God getting what he wants finally. Will we do it? I want us to stand. I can't help but couple things. If God is talking to this state about a line drawn in the sand, I would uh, have to believe that it first will need to be in the Spirit. That means the cross. 
if God is going to work through this state in relation to the rest of our nation, wouldn't this be beautiful? What if you here in Idaho became a bride of the cross? What if through you in release the life of the Lamb could go forth to our nation? What if you were to be messengers of the cross to the church? I strongly believe that what God has spoken in the natural has its greater fulfillment in the spiritual. That you're called to be a people of distinction. And it begins internally. An uncompromising, unmixed people who embrace the cross of Christ. Therefore, you will have the inner strength of God to withstand the battle and the storms that are in front of you. Otherwise, we simply won't have it. We will cave. We will quit. The battle will become too great for us. Human strength and endurance will not help us in this matter. We need divine strength and divine help. I don't believe God sends anybody anywhere just so we can have a great meeting. Do you? Do you really believe that? He's not random, I agree. God's coming to you, God's coming to me, has eternity attached to it and that purpose of eternity attached to it. I believe he sees in you something called a willing heart to embrace the dying of the Lord so that the life of the Lord may be revealed. I equally believe this in the natural, that you as a people are unwilling to embrace death so that the purpose of God in our nation can be restored. I've never said that to a congregation. Hope to never have to say it again. call is the same but it begins in the spirit so I want us uh, if you're willing if you want to you don't have to you know we all have a sword I just want us to raise it up but I want us to raise it up to him in a dedication and in a new consecration, and in a new commitment. You can pray with me if you want. We are yours, Lord. I am not my own. I have been bought with a price. My goal is to glorify God in my body. We stand willing before you tonight, Lord. Willing warriors. Willing servants, willing vessels. We want your will to be done in us and through us and in this city and in this state and in this nation and from wherever else to wherever else you will take it.
Enlarge our spiritual capacity. We ask for spiritual intelligence. The mind of Christ. And we embrace the cross of Christ. The crucified life. The Lamb's life in the becoming one with you as in Genesis 2 and as in Ephesians 5. The two shall become one. We would be one with you, Lamb of God, in life, in mind, in heart, and in understanding. Drive from us the fear of man. Drive from us the fear of death. And drive home in us the fear of God. We will not go quietly into the night. We refuse to be bullied. We refuse to run. We refuse to hide. We fight on our knees before the throne at the golden altar. We fight for the rights of the lamb and for the rights of the bride. We fight for a people to get out to you and for a people to be made ready unto you. We fight for your right to presence yourself in this earth. And welcome you to presence yourself in us. We forsake all other lovers. And we come out to you. Courage to your people, Lord, courage. Courage. Be very courageous, people of God. Very courageous. I now ask, Father, for the opening of doors that no man can shut right into the legislation of this state to the ears of the people in charge. And I ask for the word of the Lord. Be wise, you kings, and be warned, you judges. Kiss the son, lest he become angry and you be destroyed in your way. I ask for fire. Shut up in our bones tonight, Lord. Fresh fire. Consuming fire. Burning the wood, the hay, the stubble. Burning up the fear of man. Burning up whatever you need to burn up in us. Mixture, compromise. Burn it up, God. We do not want it. Nor do you desire it. And we say to you this simple prayer of submission. Not our will, but yours be done in these things. And that we, Lord, are with your will in this and will not back down. Arise, O oh God, and scatter your enemies. Lord, give us a people, men and women, young and old, who have calluses on their knees. Men and women of prayer. 
You want that, brothers and sisters? God, release the grace for a heavenly ground praying and release the wisdom for it and the call to it tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. We understand that, I hope, that even what he's described is not a sovereign thing, right? That it is, it requires our participation. It requires our willingness. Again, our, our aligning ourselves with the will of the Lord. Terry mentioned it earlier, it's, you know, it's one thing to come to conferences or even come to church and we nod our heads and we we agree because it's you know it's they're kind of good things you know and it's like wow yeah we should be championing these kinds of things but we need to keep in mind that it is um well let's just put it in terms of scripture faith without works right I mean, that's what it boils down to. I implore you, be accountable to the Lord. Pray, ask. Ask for all that he would send to come and help. And whether we realize it or not, we truly are in a fight for our lives, the lives of our children, our grandchildren, and we truly are fighting for the bride. Man, I... I don't want to miss our time of, our appointed time of visitation. Lord, I would just ask that you'd help us, Lord, and not that we wouldn't be passed by. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just thank you for the the time this evening. I thank you for the word, Lord. I just pray, Father, that that this would go deep into our being, Lord, and it would it would move us, Lord, literally move us to embrace the cross life. That's you, Jesus. I thank you for that. I pray now, Father, for each and every one that are here, Lord. Ask, Lord, that you just be with each one of us, Lord. That you'd send your angels, Lord, and give them charge over each one, Lord, as we go this evening, Lord, to our homes, Lord, wherever that may be. I thank you, Father, for each one that's come. Pray blessing, Lord, over each one. I thank you, Jesus, again for loving us. Once again, Lord, we say we love you. In your holy name, Jesus, again we pray.
amen.